Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to our second session of a three-part series of virtual roundtable discussions on advancing young adult health um, convened by us at Young Invincibles. Uh, my name is Erin Hedlund. I'm the Health Policy Director at YI. Uh, for those of you who may be new to us, YI is a national nonprofit organization where our mission is to amplify the voices of young adults in the political process and expand economic opportunity for all young people, centering young people of color. We are very much looking forward to a great discussion today and have an excellent panel and I'm very excited to hear from. Um, a few quick reminders before we get started. Uh, today's conversation will be in listen only mode, um, but we please do encourage you to use the Q&A button to submit your questions and comments throughout the discussion. Uh, we have some YI uh, communication staff who will be monitoring that and we'll leave some time at the end of today's panel to uh, take some of those audience questions. You can also follow along on social with hashtag young adult health. Um, and finally, we'll have a few poll questions throughout the discussion. Um, as I am about to introduce our panel, we would also like to hear from you and hear who you are. Um, so the first poll question should be popping up in a second. Um, please take a few minutes to answer that. Okay. Um, while you're taking some time to answer that and we gather your responses, um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our wonderful panelists. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nia West Bay, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP, Karen Howard, Advocacy Manager at Mental Health America, and Brad Corton, Legislative Assistant in the Office of Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman of New, New Jersey. Um, and finally, we are hoping to be at a uh, uh, also joined by one of our young advocates from Colorado, Ariel Page, who I think is um, hopefully going to hop on in just a few minutes. All right. Is it time to see our poll results yet? Great, great. So it looks like we've got a really good mix of folks from a variety of different um, areas of focus. Thank you all for joining us today. Okay, um, before I turn it over to our wonderful panel, I want to set the stage a bit about the mental health crisis young adults are facing. We've seen rapidly growing rates of anxiety and depression and other mental health issues in young adults over the last decade. According to a study by the American Psychological Association, between 2008 and 2017, the amount of young adults that experience a serious psychological distress increased 71%. Um, between young adults between 18 and 25. And most notably, a serious psychological distress increased by 78% among that age group over that 10 year period. Currently, young adults between 18 and 25 report the highest levels of mental health issues compared to all other age groups, with about one in four experiencing a mental health il illness and about 8% reporting a serious mental health illness. Suicide ideation has also increased over that time period as well. Uh, currently, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people under the age of 34. And according to CDC data, young people who identify as lesbian, gay, or bi are four times more likely to attempt suicide compared to straight young people. And transgender adults are 12 times more likely to attempt suicide compared to the general population. And of course, these are all statistics gathered before the COVID pandemic hit. The severe economic impact, job losses, social isolation, and fear of the deadly disease itself is causing anxiety and depression to skyrocket among millions of Americans. Uh, the Washington Post recently reported a jump from 25% to 50% of Americans reporting feelings of depression once the pandemic hit, and a full one-third of all Amer Americans reporting signs of clinical depression and anxiety. Asian Americans have also reported spikes in depression and anxiety as xenophobia and racist comments referring to the coronavirus as the Chinese virus have erupted. And then as our collective mental health is suffering at an all time high, the nine minute video of George Floyd's death went viral, causing anxiety and depression rates in black Americans to spike to higher rates than any other racial group. According to that same ongoing Washington Post survey, rates of Black Americans showing clinical positive signs of anxiety and depression jumped from 36% to 41% within one week. At that same time, the rate for white Americans stayed largely the same at around 30%. While rates 
across all racial and ethnic groups have increased significantly since the start of the pandemic, young people of color have been especially hard hit. Many young workers in the restaurant and retail industries were the first to lose their jobs, losing their income and a, any sense of security. Many college students abruptly had to leave college or leave their campus, losing not only their housing, but potentially jeopardizing their education. And young adults are still uninsured at higher rates compared to all other uh, older adults. Um, and even for those who have health insurance, accessing mental health services can still be out of reach. Uh, while this is a pretty bleak picture, um, I'm excited for our panel to dive into policies that we could advocate for to increase access, improve quality of care, ensure that that care is culturally competent, and continue to advance young adult health. And there have been some promising measures taken. Uh, for example, healthcare providers uh, quickly pivoted to telehealth once the pandemic hit, and we've seen a huge increase in telehealth visits in the mental health space, uh, which I think can be a really effective way to um, expand access, especially, especially for those who lack access to physical spaces, whether that's because they live in a rural area or just lack transportation. Uh, young people especially are very comfortable with technology and may be more prone to text therapy or apps if given an affordable option. Uh, the, po the COVID pandemic has also really shined a spotlight on the brewing mental health crisis across our country. Um, and I think it's serving as somewhat of a wake up call that we really need to treat mental health just as seriously as we treat our physical health. And we need to greatly improve parity implementation so that people can actually access the care that, we, that they need. And we need to heavily invest in our mental health workforce. These are just some of the policy ideas I am excited to get into in today's discussion. Um, now I would love to kick it off to our panel. So it looks like Ariel is still having some trouble uh, joining us. So Karen, I'm actually going to start with you if that's okay. Of course. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, Erin, for coordinating um, this wonderful panel. And I think it'll be useful information for young people and older adults alike to um, use in their own recovery as well as um, in their advocacy. So I'm Karen Howard. Uh, I'm the advocacy manager at Mental Health America for about three and a half years. I've been in this position and previously worked in um, uh, Congress as a staffer and on political campaigns. Um, so I kind of found that it was really important and the issue that kept coming up for me was mental health. And so I had a personal connection because at um, 20, 20 years old or 19 years old in college, I was um, uh, given a diagnosis um, which helped me feel better about some of the things that I was experiencing, but I also realized that connecting with services that were um, really useful was difficult. Um, so <clears throat> I'm really excited to be doing this work and I'm happy to be reached offline following this um, since I will have to jump off a little early. So Mental Health America is the oldest and leading community-based consumer advocacy organization. We're designed to help individuals with mental illnesses fight in the open. Um, today, we're dedicated towards the overall mental health of all Americans, as well as advocating for those with serious mental illnesses. Uh, because as a matter of public policy, mental health conditions are the only ones we wait until stage four to respond to, and we often do so inappropriately through forced hospitalization or incarceration. Mental Health America operates under the before stage four philosophy, which is a framework that prioritizes prevention for everyone, early intervention for those at risk, integrated and community-based services and supports for those who need them with recovery as the goal, because we know that over 95% of people can recover from a mental health condition, whether chronic or episodic, and live a life that is fulfilling to them. MHA promotes peer support as part of recovery, and we've been involved in most legislative victories over the last 100 years, including the groundbreaking Affordable Care Act, which raised the coverage age children can stay on their parents' insurance through 25, um, and including this year's uh, COVID-19 emergency relief bills 
which include policy changes to expand telehealth services to audio only and telephone services without video as we continue to practice physical distancing. Many people um, who are young adults and youth are experiencing increased feelings of loneliness and isolation as they maneuver social distancing away from friends and family. This is especially true for only children. For young adults, the decrease in socialization and loss of support system, in addition to some of the academic expectations, has had the impact of making some people feel so paralyzed. They're uncertain how to move forward um, after graduation or um, kind of the, the semester ending. Um, their, their, their job search and other endeavors are kind of at a halt right now. In addition to anxiety related to the virus and crises related to quarantine, financial issues, bereavement, nearly everyone is affected by social media and the news media's fetish, fetish, fetishization of police killings of Black people. With respect to attitudes towards mental health and mental illness, young adults are actually more open than previous generations, tapping into their moods when things don't feel right and taking action to seek help. MHA's largest program is an online screening program, which sees about 5,000 visitors daily now since COVID. Um, and about 65% of those people screening are between the ages of 11 and 24 years old. The mental health impacts of COVID, social unrest, um, there is more pronounced in young people ages 25 and under. Roughly nine in 10 are screening positively for moderate to severe depression. And roughly eight in 10 are screening positively for moderate to severe anxiety. We also know that uh, suicidal ideation is increasing. In the month of May, which is Mental Health Month, 21,000 people identified as having thoughts of suicide or self-harm. Uh, which is like a 3,000% increase over what we had seen previously. Uh, rates of suicide are tri have tripled um, in adults aged 10 years to 24 years and is the second leading cause of death for the young people that we're talking to today. MHA releases annually a May is Mental Health Month Toolkit. This year's focus is on owning your feelings, finding the positive, eliminating toxic influences, creating healthy routines, supporting others, and connecting others. We also annually release a Back to School Toolkit, toolkit in August and a uh, Minority Mental Health Month Toolkit, which has just recently been renamed to the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Toolkit for July. This month will uh, focus on Black Lives Matter and anti-racism content, as well as the challenges faced by people that are LGBTQ. Um, as well, Men Mental Health America's screening program um, was so successful that we started the Screening to Supports program, which um, connects people to services, um, whether professional, in-person, or virtual. And it also connects people to platforms that allow them to talk and interact with other people that are experiencing some of the same symptoms as they. Um, and there's also general information about different mental health conditions and um, do-it-yourself resources and ideas uh, for how to kind of practice self-care. So should I just go right into what we think some of our policy solutions are or kind of, how, how do you want us to do this? Yeah, please do, please do. Yeah, okay, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm just, uh, making sure I'm on track here. So um, for, you know, right now is, is really a ripe time to be discussing mental health and substance use disorders and the policy scheme because of how there's just, a, 
special attention being paid to that since everyone right now is kind of going through a high stress or high anxiety time. So we're really happy that mental health can um, be a bipartisan issue and that we can work on both sides of the aisle with both the administration and Congress and other um, state and local leaders on some of these issues. I will say that young people are taking a lead and um, starting to create solutions themselves. For instance, um, there are two young um, Black students, Hannah and Luke from Atlanta that created the Not Okay app. They actually won MHA's Empower Award um, for being youth taking action. Um, and that's an app that anyone can download from an app store and create kind of a support system or circle of trust. You choose five people that you would want to check in on you if in fact you're having a crisis. And in terms of um, uh, policy solutions, MHA would like for the FDA and CMS to go ahead and um, start helping create pathways for adoption of digital technologies. Um, that right now insurance providers and um, insurance companies and providers are unsure of how to bill for and how to um, determine the time that they spend on the apps. It's just kind of a, um, you know, technology is moving a lot more quickly than our kind of health policy. So we encourage, um, we're encouraging that you know, digital technologies are being used and recognized for the therapeutic properties that they have. Um, we also are focusing and on some um, school-based services for prevention and early intervention. We think that um, Representative um, Bonnie Watson Coleman's bill, um, Representative uh, Napolitano's bill, Mental Health and Students, uh, Mental Health Services for Students Act. These bills will help um, inter help students get services earlier, um, where they are um, in schools, to prevent getting into crisis mode when they're um, older. And so, mental health conditions, fifty percent of them manifest by age fourteen. Um, and then 75% of them manifest by age 24. So if these are, you know, most of them are going to manifest while people are still in school. We want to be able to get them connected with services right away. And then um, we certainly are promoting and working on equal treatment of behavioral health in healthcare. Um, we saw a really great uh, court case come out last year. Oof, it seemed like yesterday that it happened. It's been over a year now that um, United Behavioral Health was told that they um, violated parity laws. So we're working on that front and we want people to be able to go into their family doctors and get connected with services right away, um, behavioral health services right away. We think the integration of behavioral health services into primary care through models like collaborative care is helpful. And we see, especially in young, in youth and young people, that collaborative care is helpful and allows them to get back to feeling better. And, and the model really prioritizes um, connecting primary care doctors or family doctors with psychiatrists and other behavioral health specialists so that they feel more comfortable providing advice and counsel to their patients. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're also looking at um, growing the behavioral health workforce overall since there are shortages in every state. Um, we think peer support specialists can help uh, supplement the workforce and um, we know that peer support uh, helps keep people out of hospitals, helps people engage in care, and helps people feel like what they're experiencing is absolutely typical and normal, and they don't have to feel ashamed or isolate themselves because of any um, mental health issues that might be going on. We also need general education to empower the individual to advocate for themselves. Um, and not just accept what might be given to them or what treatment plan is given to them. And we uh, think that doing so by, um, by boosting the, um, the power of the patient is important. And um, we also want people to know that 
you know, general education around understanding interpersonal relationships and socialization is a major part of, or contributor to a healthy mental status. So understanding that with therapy, treatment, social support, and all of these other peer support and all of these other factors that kind of help, um, help uh, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together, that um, there is, you know, a path to recovery and there's no one right answer. Um, finally, we want to acknowledge that many things young people face uh, is traumatizing and we must ensure providers are equipped to appropriately help manage trauma through trauma-informed practices and practices that are anti-racist. Many young people and adults uh, face microaggressions in behavioral health treatment uh, because of their race or color, and, and we want to make sure that we overcome that through any um, policy changes. And finally, um, we think that uh, improving access to crisis services is really important. If someone needs help, instead of calling 911, we want them to be able to call 988. And so we are pushing, pushing, pushing for the bill um, HR 4194, which passed the Senate already. We're, we're pushing the House to go ahead and pass that bill. And um, we're happy that Chairman Pai at the FCC uh, made his announcement on Tuesday that they would be moving forward with rolling out 988 so that people uh, in crisis don't have to remember a long 1-800 uh, number. So thank you, Erin. Um, I hope that's <laughs> helpful and uh, I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much for that great overview of all the wonderful work you were doing at MHA. Um, really excited to have you here. Um, Ariel, thanks so much for hopping on. Glad you could make it. Um, I, I uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I, I'm so sorry. I thought it was mountain time, so I, that's why I'm late. I didn't know it was Eastern time, so I messed that up, but I'm happy to be here, and Karen, uh, everything that you said was amazing, and it's going to be hard to <laughs> go off of that, but I, everything you said, I just kept snapping my fingers. Just, it, it was beautiful. You were on point, and I, I appreciate you. Um, should I start, or do we want to, I don't know how you guys want to do this, being that I'm late. No, you're, you're, you're not late. You're right on time. We're all good. Um, okay, great. In kind of our opening comments. So if you want to just share a little bit, um, so I'll give a, a quick background. Ariel is one of our um, alumni of our Young Advocate Program in Colorado and current advisory board member um, and has been a phenomenal young leader working to expand mental health access on college campuses. So Ariel, if you want to just share a little bit about your work at YI um, and a little bit about what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so I joined Young Invincibles with, the, with my passion in regards to growing up with a mother that was mentally ill and having to deal with my own um, mental health issues. And when my friend passed on this opportunity to me, I thought that it was perfect. As a woman of color, I feel like our communities don't really get enough um, mental health help because it's not something that we necessarily talk about a lot because we have so many other concerns within our community and there's so much stigma within our community that we feel like it's not that we don't care about each other's mental health it's just like we don't have the time to really focus on it because we're focused on putting food on the table trying to figure out where the best schools are if we can get to them and trying to keep ourselves out of jail and just dealing with our different communities that have so many just so much disparity within them so when i saw the opportunity with young invincible I jumped at it because I thought that, hey, this is a way for me to have a voice in regards to what I want to give back to my community because the community is not being listened to. I feel like current events have really shown that. So when I got with Young Invincibles, I go to MSU at Auraria campus. They had this whole thing where we were able to reach out to different types of people all over the campus and just make mental health resources more visible because we had seen through what we were doing is that a lot of students need help, but they didn't know where to go. 
and we threw um, an event at the end of the spring semester that was called Who Is Taking Care of You? And we did a survey of the 30 to 35 people that showed up and we asked, would you like there to be more mental health services on campus? And almost everyone raised their hand. And that is a drop in the bucket of about a 40,000 um, student community. So I'm really happy that I've been able to work with Young Invincibles because I've seen what they did. There has been so many different policy changes that have been implemented that have helped people get the help that they need. And I wanna continue doing this because it's very, it's very, I, I feel like the world needs it more than ever with what's going on with COVID, what's going on with what I'm seeing as the next wave of the civil rights movement. We definitely need some mental health resources because people are scared, they're isolated, they're angry, they're filled with sorrow and, and, and they need somebody to talk to. So I think that this discussion is very important. Great. Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, and I would just say, I think some of, the, some of the things that you all did in Cal Colorado, I mean, you say that Young Vince did, but it was really young adult led. I mean, I think it was you and the other college students who were really leading that work and doing that work and making change happen. So I wanna make sure that you're taking credit for that, not us. Um, oh, well, I, I feel like Young Invincibles just kind of is an umbrella um, for all of the young people that come together because Young Invincibles has given young people a voice that they really didn't have before. Um, I remember Christina um, at a conference um, who used to be one of the directors, she said that when like young people were trying to get insurance, they were calling these people, oh, you're young invincibles, like you think that you don't need insurance. We're just like, no, we do need insurance. We don't think we're invincible. We just want proper health care. And I think that this falls in line with everything that's going on today with mental health in general and with what's going on in general. It's just like people want help. People want, they don't think they're invincible, but they know that we're all fragile. We know that we all need help. We all know that we, we, we need a voice. And that's why I think that Young Invincibles is just this umbrella that gives so many young people that wouldn't have had a voice, a voice, especially people of color. And that's what I like about it. And that's what I've been drawn to. And especially now, I, now more than ever, I think it's very important to, give people that have experienced disparity in America and our people of color and our people that are minorities like this place where they can feel safe and where they can speak and that's where I feel we're at right now and I'm so as I said I'm so glad that we're having this discussion. Great thank you so much and we definitely will have lots of time to get into a lot of Q&A on all these issues as well. Uh, but next, I would love to turn it over to you, Dr. Nia Westbay, who again is the Senior Policy Analyst at CLASP. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all so much for having me with this great group of folks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's afternoon probably everywhere that's listening. Um, I am with the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP, which is a just over 50-year-old uh, anti-poverty policy advocacy organization in Washington, D.C., um, we do our work in six main policy teams at CLASP. Uh, we have one that is focused on income and work supports, which are the different types of public benefits that people might need. We have a team focused on post-secondary education and workforce development. We have a job quality team that focuses on issues like paid family medical leave, fair scheduling, that sort of thing. We have um, an early childhood education and child care team. We have a, a newer team that's focused on immigration policy and immigrant families, and then the youth team, which is where I sit. Um, our team's work obviously intersects with all of those other areas in the organization because young people are impacted by all of those different things. And we also tend to hold a lot of the cross-sectional work in the organization, including um, our mental health work. So a huge part of what I focus on is youth and young adult mental health, but it's in the context of a team that's really focused on young people between the ages of 16, 24, 25, 26, it's kind of creeping up, um, who, have, um, who are not in school, not in work, or um, young people who are experiencing poverty, who are living in low-income communities, 
and um, especially young people of color in those circumstances. So that's sort of the team overview. The mental health work that we do, do focus on youth and young adults has really um, been important in the last couple of years and really came out of conversations in some of the other areas where we work, where folks are saying that um, this is an, I'm a workforce professional, but because young people's mental health and trauma has not been addressed, how are they supposed to be successful in my employment program or in my education program or all these other areas where we work? Um, and we really sort of came to an understanding that if we can't tackle this issue, then we're not going to be able to work effectively for economic justice for young people. Uh, so we really started out a couple of years having conversations with young people all around the country. It's been one of the most powerful things that I've gotten to do in my time at class is go out and have focus groups. Um, starting at a really basic level, like what does mental health mean to you? What are the things that are stressors in your community? What's working? What's not working? What does health insurance have to do with all of this? Um, and we had these conversations with African American young people initially, and then talked to all kinds of other groups of young people around the country. We talked to Native young people living in urban areas. We talked to Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian young people. We talked to young people experiencing homelessness. We talked to young people in predominantly white rural areas, just all different types of areas around the country. Um, and really we're hearing a lot of, um, there were some common themes across those groups, some unique perspectives, but all of it sort of, I think has uniquely prepared us for this moment that we're in right now, because the issues that we're talking about are not new. Um, the young people that we talked with talked about racism and discrimination of different forms as stresses that they were experienced when I was talking to them two or three years ago. The young people that we interviewed talked about the problematic role of law enforcement in mental health situations two and three years ago. You know, the young people that we were talking to were flagging the challenges associated with um, being asked to get mental health services from a provider that doesn't look like you, that you don't feel understands your experience and the real value and importance of being able to talk to um, people who have shared lived experience, who, have, um, who are from the same community as you and that that's really where young people see their support. And that sort of has led us to a place where we've been thinking a lot about a lot of the same types of policies that Karen talked about that Mental Health of America is supporting. Um, but I wanna highlight just a couple of things that I think we're thinking about in this particular moment. Um, because if we're, as we're having these conversations, as we've been having protests, as everyone has been living a global pandemic for the last few months, um, we've really been thinking about a couple of concepts that we heard from young people. One is historical and cultural trauma. We had um, a lot of conversations with young people about the ways that the past impact mental health in the present, as well as sort of large scale challenges like a pandemic are cultural traumas that really all of us are experiencing in this moment. Um, and we really want to think in our mental health investments about how we respond, recognize and respond to the ongoing and historic traumas that have been experienced in communities of color with the current moment of the pandemic and its disproportionate impact on people of color, but as well as with the long history of the problematic interactions of law enforcement and communities of color, particularly black communities. Um, so we really wanna think about what are investments that we can make that acknowledge and respond to that, those historical and cultural traumas um, in order to really start to get more equitable outcomes. Secondly, we're definitely thinking about how we strengthen the broader community and the broader community's capacity to respond, both support um, people's mental health and wellness, as well as um, respond to mental health challenges as they arise. Um, what came out of our conversations with young people was that their view of mental health is not like a typical clinical view of mental health. They're talking about what they want to be as opposed to what they don't want to be about what they what are the skills what are the assets what are the abilities that they want to um, develop for themselves as opposed to what are the things that are wrong with us or that um, you know what we that kind of thing and so we want to make sure that our systems are set up to support young people building those skills and abilities and competencies and strengths that they're talking about and that when a young person is having a mental health challenge that there are lots and lots of people in the community who know how to meet that challenge and support that young person in that moment and help connect them to whatever additional resources they need. So definitely thinking about that piece a lot. And then I think the third thing that we've been thinking about is um, to this point about police being the responders in a mental health crisis. We really think that that's not appropriate. Those are not 
um, the people who should be responding in a mental health crisis. Um, and so how do we build emergency response systems in our communities that when somebody is having a mental health crisis, that's who you call, the 988 idea that we were just talking about, right? Where you're responding with a social worker, with somebody trained in de-escalation, with somebody, you know, with somebody who has the actual right credentials to be addressing somebody in that moment to help to bring them down and then help to um, move them to whatever next step they need in terms of support. So that's what I'll say for now. I'm looking forward to delving further into all of that as well as some of the other things that we work on in this conversation, um, but really just wanted to set that up as our starting point. Thank you so much. That's really, really great. And I really appreciate you sharing all of that. I'm just such a huge fan of CLASP and everything that you're doing. So I'm, I'm excited to get into it. Um, and finally, last but not least, we're joined by Brad Horton, who is with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman's office. Um, for those who maybe don't know, Congresswoman Watson Coleman is the chair of the Emergency Mental Health Task Force under the CDC and has do, been doing just tremendous work to highlight some of the alarming trends in mental health um, and suicide, particularly among Black youth. Um, Brad, so happy to have you here. Thank you. No, thank you. I really appreciate this. Um, and I'm grateful to be um, part of this panel hosted by YI and with the other panelists. Um, I, as Aaron mentioned, I am with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. She represents the 12th District of New Jersey. Uh, major cities you might know of are the Capitol in Princeton and Plainsfield. Um, so actually just to also let you know, um, just to mention that um, I have had personal history as well with mental illness. Um, just so like the um, history for me, I was originally diagnosed with OCD and anxiety disorders back in when I was 10. So I have a personal connection with this uh, policy issue as well as uh, the privilege of also addressing a greater issue, uh, the issue in uh, for my boss in Congress. So um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, the Congressman is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Emergency Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health. Uh, that task force started, um, the idea really started almost two years ago um, when there was a report from a JAMA medical uh, paper that ex highlighted the rate of suicide among black uh, boys between the ages of five and 12 to be twice as high as white boys. And again, that comes to the whole con um, issue that most people in the general public um, do not think of mental health as anything but a white man's disease. Um, there's still that stigma and that concept that this doesn't happen to any other groups. This only happens to white people. Um, but that was the alarm that triggered both myself and my boss, and we started to do more research and conducting um, into understanding the why that report and where that information came from. Along the way, we um, interacted with other professionals in the field, uh, Dr. Alfie Brindley Nobel, Dr. Michael Lindsay of NY, um, the NYU McSylvan Institute, uh, Dr. Donna Barnes, and many others where we kind of talked to them, had a briefing, and talked about like the issues of divert of Dis racial disparities in research as well as uh, providing treatment. And it was at that stage when the idea came up of to take a real focus on doing a task force. So in 2019, last year, the Congresswoman uh, went to the chair of the CBC and organized the task force, uh, which had three primary goals. The first was to educate members of Congress and their staff on the issue of black youth suicide and mental health. The second was to do a general awareness campaign with their constituents as well as with the general public at large. And the third was to compose a report by the end of the year, which was to highlight some of the key issues and findings as well as find potential solutions and what next steps should be taken. Um, during last year, we held about five or six hearings, town halls, uh, the task force was made of 13 or 14 other members of the CBC and they held town halls in their own districts across the country. And uh, the report was released in December. Um, obviously, some of the statistics that were already talked about, we know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth. Um, it was obviously some of the reports that also found that um, the suicide ideation uh, among black youth 
um, between 91 and 2017 went up by 73%. Um, suicide attempts by black males went up 122% during that same time. And out of, even though the general trend for most uh, groups by race was either going up slowly or uh, plateauing, uh, the rate among black youth was skyrocketing and it was a complete alarm. So that report, which is out, um, is goal is to help push the message that this is a huge problem still and that we need to address it. Now, um, that report came out in December. We are still working to educate the public and doing what we can to raise awareness, um, of course, with COVID and the economic um, downturn, as well as the um, rise of uh, protest and the killing of George Floyd, it has changed the narrative how much more important mental health is, um, addressing mental health is uh, for not just uh, youth, but obviously for people of color and especially the black community. So the question really now is where we go from here. Um, you know, there are short term goals we're looking at, you know, as mentioned, there's the 988 number that's being pushed through the FCC, as well as Congress to help provide funding for it, um, increasing telehealth and access so that people, no matter where they are, can get access to it, uh, to a therapist. But obviously, there are long term um, issues that need to be addressed, starting with the basic fact of research, you know, a lot of research still need to be done by the NIH, CDC, and SAMHSA. I mean, and any funding for that has to also be culturally competent. And that's one of the biggest concerns when it comes to any work that we do. Um, whether, because there's still the setting that a lot of research is done based off of, you know, a white male perspective, not necessarily the perspective of a black boy or black girl. Um, so information can be different. And we need to make sure there's proper research into that to know what the best approach is to helping these communities. Then you need to make sure that like mentioned, there should be people, um, experts um, who look like you when you're dealing with, them, with therapists and counselors, um, which is why, you know, pushing for increased funding in things like the Minority Fellowship Program um, so that more uh, black and brown therapists, counselors, nurses can come into the stage, um, into the field and help is very cr uh, critical. And finally, obviously, schools is probably the most important place because that's the one place where we know most kids, um, uh, we can interact with most children and have the most direct impact, which is why, you know, increasing the amount of counselors, therapists, mental health services at schools is critical. You know, we live in a country, unfortunately, that has more resource officers, cops at schools than mental health professionals, therapists, and that is unfortunate uh, situation where we're not, you know, there's a sense of militarization at a school potentially instead of an area where kids should be feel welcome and get resources that can help them. Um, but that is, you know, it's a long journey and, you know, the Congresswoman is very committed. And as mentioned earlier, uh, the Congresswoman had a bill that was created out of this report called the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act um, 2019, which is a coming out an omnibus bill that contains other aspects of so funding for uh, schools to help mental health professionals, increase funding the MF, um, MFP, increase fundings for NIH to do specific research um, and other areas of that specialty. Great, thank you so much, Brad. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of tremendous work that you're, you are doing and the task force is doing, we appreciate it. Um, okay, so now as we pivot into the Q&A portion of today's program, um, I believe there was another poll question that you should have seen. Um, so if we can see the results to that. Great. Um, so I think we've touched on a lot of these issues already, but definitely disparities in access seems to be ranked the highest that actually tied with improving cultural competency among mental health providers. So I know we've touched on that a little bit and hopefully we'll get into it even more in the Q&A. Um, and I uh, just want to note, I know Karen has to hop off a little early today. Uh, I really want to say now, appreciate your time being here. Um, hopefully we'll get a few questions in before you have to hop off. Um, but to start, Ariel, I'd like to actually turn it over to you. Um, we talked a little bit about your work in Colorado, um, working to expand mental health services on college campuses. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more about your thoughts of what are the biggest challenges you think college students face in accessing mental health care? And then thinking about how COVID has just dramatically changed college life 
Um, how do you see those problems worsening during the pandemic and going into the next fall semester? Um, so I'm going to start with um, how COVID has kind of worsened things for people that will need uh, mental health resources. Being that a lot of us have had to stay at home, work from home, go to class from home, there's been this big feeling of isolation. And then on top of that, we're seeing another wave of a civil rights movement and extreme police brutality through all of that. I feel like a lot of students, no matter their color, if they have a heart, which most of us do, um, they are seeing this and it can lead to a lot of anger and a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety and just so, and, you, and there's not anybody to talk to and that's hard. And on top of that, I'm gonna go back to what you said before in regards to the challenges that people face in regards to accessing mental health resources. Number one, on Auraria campus, what I said before, there wasn't a lot of visibility in regards to where can I go to talk to somebody, whether it's on campus or off campus. Number two, there is also how can I afford it if I don't have insurance, if I, and even if I can pay out of pocket, can I really do that? Number three, there's proximity, state of mind, and just if you are in a place where you are incredibly depressed and you have anxiety or the agoraphobia that comes with it, if there's a place that only you can afford that's way far away, are you really going to want to get out of bed when you're that depressed to go and to seek help? And even if you do go to that first appointment, how many times are you going to make it back to really get the help that you need? And then there's stigma because a lot of us, especially I know, as a black woman in the black community, we don't really talk about that stuff. Like, I, I, I'm so happy that there's been a lot of black leaders that have been rising up and making these things more prevalent as far as like the visibility and how we are starting to talk about it. But all in all, like we, we haven't really talked about this stuff for a long time. And especially like with minorities, like you, you, we're more, worried about putting food on the table than we are if we're depressed or not. So I feel like that is a challenge and with COVID-19 and what we're seeing in the news and this world, all of it's a challenge. And I feel like it's a challenge, but with telehealth, like, and like I was talking about proximity, I feel like more people can actually get on the computer and be able to talk to somebody and not have to leave their house, which it might seem simple, but to somebody like me who has had agoraphobia, that means the world. Like if you can work from home and if you can like talk to somebody from home, um, that, can save pe that can save people's lives because a lot of people feel alone right now, especially people of color when they're seeing a world that is not on their side. So I'm, I'm really hoping that conversations like this will continue, not just with students, but with the entire country, because there are so many things going on where people are not being listened to. And there are so many people that are just living alone in fear and in depression, and they feel like they have no one to talk to. And when you're in college, it is so hard already. You have a giant workload, you're probably working a part-time job or a full-time job, you probably have family that you have to take care of too, and then you have all of this come on top of you, and then I work for the unemployment department right now, that's a mess too, so if you lose your job, you don't even know where you're going to get your money from, so that's just, that's just a big old bubble of anxiety, depression, and a lot of different things that I'm hoping can be remedied by having discussions like this, but I feel like we really have a long way to go. And it's really sad that stuff like this that's happening right now isn't being put on the forefront of America because there aren't enough discussions being had. We're worried about so many other things instead of our people that are hurting, especially our students. 
especially people of color, especially like minorities of all different types. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I mean, a lot of what you said, I think really, really resonates. Um, I think one of the things I saw right as the, a lot of campuses were being shut down and students had to leave this last spring semester, you know, I was looking into whether or not um, students who had student health insurance would be able to use that if they were moving to a new city or new state. And there's a variety of kind of complicated questions that go into that. But um, as I was looking to that, it seemed that a lot of student health centers were actually still open and offering telehealth services. So if you were receiving mental health counseling through your student health center but had to leave campus, you could still get that. But I think there's a real disconnect in knowing that. Like you said earlier, just the issue of access and making this information invisible. So a lot of campuses have these services, but students don't know when or where or how to access them, which I think is uh, just a real disconnect of, of something that actually does exist, even though we do need to expand it. So Exactly. And like I was taught, like you just said about visibility, a lot of people that that really need help like me myself when I've had depression it's hard to even get out of bed let alone go out and find where to get help especially if you don't have the money to pay for it and in an ideal world in my mind I feel like your um, your tuition should pay for the health care plus mental health care that you get which it kind of does but at MSU and um, at Aurora campus as a whole, depending on how much you make, you will have to pay a certain amount of money. And I don't think that that's all right. I feel like we pay enough for college, which has exorbitant prices, um, let alone the textbooks and are just are, are paying for our lives. We should have our mental health, which is the biggest thing that you're gonna be dealing with while you're in college be a part of our tuition. That would be ideal for me. Um, and I think for a lot of people, but we don't have that. And like you said, with the visibility, a lot of people just don't know where to go and they don't have the time because you're trying to focus on your homework, you're trying to focus on your job, you're trying to focus on your family. Now we have COVID-19, you can't even leave your house if it's not necessary. So there's just so much. And I feel like it's a huge, it, it creates more disparity in regards to getting mental, the mental health treatment that a lot of people need, especially at this time where there's so much isolation that we just don't have. And I think that that's a bigger discussion that we need to have. And I'm happy that we're starting it today. Absolutely. Um, Karen, I, I wanna see if I can go to you next. Um, I know you talked about this a lot in your opening, but maybe if you can just share a little bit more about how um, your work at Mental Mental Health America has changed in reaction to the COVID pandemic and what policies you're advocating for right now to kind of meet the needs of young people as we've all been talking about. Yeah, um, so MHA, you know, covers um, or advocates for all policies for mental health, whether it's related to education space, healthcare space, criminal justice, um, housing, um, we're in every area because our mental health does impact every area of our lives. And um, I think though now in the middle of COVID, um, there was certainly a response that was more of like, how can we get crisis services or services to people right here, right now? So we kind of uh, pivoted from some of our long game a long-term visions for like um, better healthcare coverage so that so many millions of people, you know, aren't without access and Medicaid expansion and um, some of the um, kind of larger access fights. Um, we we kind of pivoted from those and looked at more, how can people get help right now? And one way was through telehealth. And so we put a lot of fight but um, up to expand telehealth services so that they could so that people could um, use their telephones that may not have video access or secure access encrypted you know access um, to be able to get services and we were really really happy to see CMS um, expand um, and say that they were going to cover uh, mental health services 
um, that were not on video. And then we were really happy to see that there was this um, agreement by private commercial insurers that they would kind of follow suit in whatever medic changes Medicare made. And um, so we have tried to kind of continue to advocate for these telehealth changes to be made permanent beyond uh, the pandemic, because it's really important that once the public health declarate, emergency declaration is lifted, that people still continue to have access to these same services um, at the same price or same, you know, um, cost as uh, an in-person visit. So we're focusing on that. Um, and we're also focusing on helping get people the crisis services that they need right now, um, including through uh, access to 988, which would be, um, I think, just a huge boon for um, people across the nation. It would be a lot easier in crisis to remember the number. Um, and then we think that Congress will also expand through the through the legislation, expand funding for crisis services so that the increased need is met with increased resources and call centers and crisis service and mobile service units are not um, um, overwhelmed with the demand and unable to meet the needs that have come up. So we're, um, you know, focusing on those two things um, and in COVID, there, we're basically turning everything virtual. All of our meetings for the rest of the year are going to be 100% virtual. So we're thinking about how to give people um, a chance to participate and be involved. Uh, we had a virtual Hill Day that we held, and that was our first time kind of doing a fully virtual Hill Day, and it seemed to be pretty successful other than some technical glitches that came up. But um, that's been a challenge, but also really rewarding to see that while people are at home um, and spending more time in front of their computers, they're also wanting to engage in ways that move forward uh, the movement and the access. And it's just remarkable that you know, this moment has called for everyone to really come together in many different ways. Um, yeah. Great, thank you so much. That's, yeah, um, I appreciate all of that work you're doing. It's good to hear that you had a successful virtual Hill Day. Yeah, we yeah. can plan more of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. West Bay, I, I wanna um, pose the next question to you, which we've touched on a bit, but I'm hoping you can kind of go into more detail on. Um, but it feels like the media has really paid a lot of uh, attention to the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on communities of color in the physical sense. But I'm, I'm hoping you can speak to the disparities we are seeing in mental health as well. And as um, Ariel talked about quite a bit, how the pandemic combined with a fight for racial justice and protests and demonstrations are impacting the mental health of, of young Black Americans specifically. Yeah, definitely. So um, I think some of the trends that Karen and Brad talked about in the opening are relevant here. And there are a couple of um, numbers that I wanted to bring up as well that show that we were already, we already had a problem, right, before the pandemic. So um, we looked at some numbers from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is an annual survey of Americans around um, a whole bunch of mental health and substance abuse and that sort of issue. Um, and so when we looked at data from 2016, we saw that one in five young people between the ages of 18 and 25 reported experiencing serious psychological distress in the last 30 days. So this is not necessarily a diagnosable disorder, but it's sort of the kind of persistent, low-grade anxiety, depression types of feelings that people might have, right? Um, and that's one in five young people who are living in poverty, specifically in that age range, right? When we looked again at the data from 2018, which was the most recent year that's available in that data set, that number had gone to one in four. So even from 2016 to 2018, we were already seeing growth in the number of young people who are reporting, young people living in poverty who are reporting that they're experiencing serious psychological distress. 
The other number that we noticed a change in, in that same period is that in 2016, there were three quarters of a million, 750,000 young people who said that at some point in the last year, they wanted mental health services and, felt, and were not able to get them, right? By the time you get to 2018, the number had gone up to 1.1 million. So this is not about young people who um, are not interested in getting this. These are people who are saying, we want help and we were unable to get it in the last year. And that number was 1.1 million before we even get to the pandemic. Um, so in preparation for this conversation today, one of the things that the Census Bureau is doing right now, um, which is actually really helpful, is um, they're doing a weekly, what they call a household pulse survey, where they are surveying a bunch of people about economic issues, education, food insecurity, all these different things that are impacted by the pandemic. And they also have some questions about mental health. So I took a look, um, the, the, the stats that you cited, Aaron, at the beginning from the Washington Post came from that data, right? Looking at young people um, and showing these sort of high levels of anxiety and depression. And so I took a look at um, the most recent week, which is the week of June 4th through 9th, where we were able to get data. So this is um, at the top of that week, uh, the police officer who murdered George Floyd was arrested. So this is sort of after the first wave of protests where we were having tear gas and having all these crackdowns and you know damage to property and all that sort of thing. Um, so this is basically the next week. Um, and first of all, I think what's really clear here is that um, nearly 70% of young people between the ages of 18 and 29 reported some level of uncontrolled worry, feeling depressed, or um, losing interest in their usual activities. And if you look at just sort of general feeling nervous, that sort of thing, that number goes up to 80%. That's all young people 18 to 29. When you look at all age groups, as a general rule, white Americans are reporting lower levels of all of these things um, than other people of color. Although black people don't particularly stand out from other people of color in the week that I looked at, um, those numbers are fairly sim similar. But what was really interesting was when I looked at just young people 18 to 25 and what their outcomes were looking like that week. And during that week, Black young people actually had the lowest levels of anxiety and depression of any other group. And what I, th I think what's really interesting there is something that we're going to have um, a conversation with some young leaders about at class on July 23rd, where we're going to really talk about the role of protest and movement building as a mental health support. And where there, while it's absolutely traumatic and devastating to see um, these videos of people that look like you being murdered in the street, of having sort of justice seem like it's not being served over and over again, the actual act of participating in protests and feeling like you can make a change and make a difference on these issues can also be something that's supportive to young people's mental health. So. Um, you know, I think it's it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of, um, again, the moment in the pandemic and the losses that we're experiencing in communities of color where those are absolutely stressors. And we have really high levels of anxiety and depression in our communities sort of across the board right now. But then there's also this moment where people are feeling like maybe a change is going to come finally. And that really may be having a positive impact on mental health. That's great, and uh, I'm really glad that you highlighted that. I think that's a, a really, really important point. Um, and I think probably particularly for young people too. Um, I, I don't know if you have data on this, but it seems like a lot of the protests have been led by young people. They're organized by young people, even teenagers in some cities who are, are putting together these you know thousand plus people events, um, which is pretty incredible. And I could see that being kind of a cathartic way to deal with some of this trauma. No, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Brad, I think this is a, a kind of a good place to pivot to you. Um, given everything that we've kind of talked about today, um, especially as we know we're still in the pandemic, the pandemic isn't over, um, what do you think Congress can do as we are continuing to think through future COVID-related legislation that, what, how can we address some of these mental health needs in some uh, legislation potentially in the more kind of immediate to near term? No, of course. Um, so obviously, Congress, as everyone, a lot of people know, Congress's main power is funding through uh, funding through grants, programs, anything through the federal agencies and providing the resources needed. Um, and that's probably its ultimate power 
in any kind of crisis right now. So as you know, we've already done trillion dollar packages um, to help relief with small businesses and um, deal with unemployment. So, and we've also put um, billions of hundreds of billion dollars in addressing the COVID disease itself. So we should also be adding some of those resources, those billions of dollars into addressing the mental health aspect of it, you know, um, whether that be to ensure that there's enough funding um, for existing um, community health centers and other resources where people um, who can gain access to it um, should. Um, along with that, you have the short-term um, conversations about telehealth, ensuring there's funding and access, improving the broadband capabilities, um, making sure that 988 number is becoming operational, even though that um, I remember seeing uh, it might take a little time, at least the process is the going. Uh, but for immediately, what Congress is working on is trying to focus on where the resource can go. And it's um, obviously a huge hurdle because there's a lot of issues going on at once. But when it comes to the mental health space, um, there are plenty of places where we can put money and resources. Actually, next week, the Energy and Commerce Committee is going to be taking a subcommittee hearing on a bunch of uh, mental health bills, including my boss's one, the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act. Um, they variety, they have a huge variety of um, aspects. Some of the bills address the school funding uh, for resources. Um, one bill deals with the um, addressing how insurance is treat mental health payments as versus physical, um, physical health payments. So there are different areas that we can uh, look to currently. And there are plenty of pieces of legislation that are currently waiting to be considered. Um, I am not a, um, I don't know what the movement is, but as mentioned before, Mental health is surprisingly to many people a bipartisan issue, but it shouldn't be because everyone deals with mental health. It's just something that we all have to um, handle. And there are plenty of people, uh, bipartisan uh, cooperation, both Republicans and Democrats are members of the Congressional Mental Health Caucus. There is a lot of common um, goals and objectives. So there is a lot of momentum. And I think with the rise of everything that's going on, there's a lot more public uh, discourse about mental health. I have to give a lot of credit to Generation Z for being very open and very uh, committed in talking about mental health. That's something I think even me as a millennial, our generation didn't do as much, but I think it does help putting these conversations in the public spotlight it has helped push policymakers to addressing them in a lot more um, urgency. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it does seem like there's um, been some resistance in the past to, you know, the ability to expand telehealth or pay providers for telehealth services similar to in-person visits. And then that just kind of went away overnight when the COVID pandemic hit. And it seems like very clearly there, there's, we have the ability to expand some of these services in a way that they can be a lot more accessible. So it's good to see Congress kind of acting on that. Um, okay, I have a couple more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. I know we've, we've had a few good questions come in um, through the chat. And if you haven't had a chance to ask a question, please do so through that Q&A. Um, but I wanted to kind of shift to talking about the behavioral health workforce a bit. Uh, I think this is something that Ariel and I have heard from college students um, who seek out services on, on campuses. Um, you really, you want to have um, access to counselors and other mental health professionals who look like you, who represent your community, um, and it tends to not always be the case. Um, so Dr. West Bay, if I could start with you, I'd just love to hear kind of your thoughts on um, how can we achieve, a, you know, a bigger and more diverse behavioral, well, uh, behavioral health workforce? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we focus on listening to young people um, is not necessarily it being about more psychiatrists, more psychologists, more social workers, more those folks. Yes, those folks, and absolutely we wanna see those fields diversify and loan forgiveness programs and all those sorts of things are very important for that. Um, but what we've also been hearing consistently, like I said, is that young people feel the most supported from people with shared background, with shared experience, um, and which brings us to some of the things that Karen talked about earlier before she could leave, really making sure that certified youth peer specialists, certified family peer specialists, certified general peer specialists are a Medicaid reimbursable service um, and that it's something that young people 
can easily access because these are folks who are using their lived experience as the expertise to support other young people. It's the exact type of peer support that young people are looking for, but they receive the professional training to be able to make sure that they can both manage their own you know, stuff while they're trying to help other young people and really, you know, sort of be effective and supporters of and connectors of young people to resources in the community. So I think we really have to broaden our understanding of what it means to grow the behavioral health workforce that is not just about sort of those traditional mental health professions, but also thinking about some of these other spaces and also making sure that we're being equitable as we expand these workforces. Um, you know, these are groups that, because they're folks with lived experience, because they're from the community, um, they are often people of color, and the reimbursement rates that are applied to those positions are often not sustainable. Um, it's not sustainable for the organizations that employ the folks. It doesn't allow for them to pay a living wage. It doesn't necessarily provide the type of career trajectory and growth that people who want to go into these professions need. Um, so we, I think it's, you know, it's two pieces. It's both making sure that this is a reimbursable service that anybody can access, particularly people with Medicaid, but then also that the reimbursement rates are such that the people who are doing the work can get paid a living wage and that the organizations that are hiring them um, sort of have the fiscal solvency to be able to continue that kind of work and have those professionals in the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, our, our panel last week was all about coverage and kind of closing disparities and coverage gaps and where a lot of young people are, are still uninsured and why they're uninsured. And one of the biggest reasons that we talked about is the lack of Medicaid expansion in 14 states. Um, in those states, the vast majority of young people who don't have coverage fall into the Medicaid gap. Um, and meanwhile, Medicaid is the largest payer of mental health services. So um, there's a lot of work that we can do kind of across the board to, to close those gaps. Yeah, we took a look at some of those numbers. It is, it's absolutely appalling. And what's really interesting is that in every single one of these states where Medicaid has not been expanded, a large proportion of the young people living in poverty are young people of color. Mm -hmm. At least 25% in every state, and some of the states upwards of 50, 60%. And so it's a really glaring, glaring equity issue um, that we're not seeing Medicaid expansion in these places with such large populations of young people of color. Young people of color are much more likely to have their insurance through Medicaid because they may not have a parent that has a job that allows them to keep their kid on insurance until they're 26. For those young people, Medicaid expansion is the comparable support. That is what lets young people have coverage. And that's just sort of a fundamental baseline that it certainly doesn't open the door all the way, but you're not going to be able to access the full array of services that are available if you can't get health insurance coverage. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, great. I know we only have a few minutes left um, in our, our poll. I think they were maybe listening to us as they were voting, but um, incentivizing states to expand Medicaid scored really, really well. Um, as well as providing um, or better prioritizing integrated systems across schools, communities, providers, et cetera. I think Brad spoke to that quite a bit earlier. Um, so it definitely seems like we're on the, the right track as our audience now. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through our, some of our audience Q&A that we have here. Um, Ariel, we have a question um, to you. Um, Selena asks, what are some of the policies that you've seen change that you think are the most important? I think that was in reference to some of the campus-based work you were talking about earlier. Oh, I think you're still muted, Ariel. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so when I was working with Young Invincibles um, last year, the most important things that I saw in regards to visibility was us getting um, the syllabus changed because every year, every semester, every student is gonna see their syllabus. So to have that information in regards to mental health resources put on the back of the syllabus so that people know where to go, that was huge. Also, um, somebody that we worked with who is a tri-institutional um, health um, care person for all the colleges, UCD, um, MSU and CCD, he had um, the student IDs. 
he put on the back, he had it made so that on the back you could get mental health resources. Also, um, Aurora Campus has a thing where they will send you an alert when there's a crime done or when there's something huge that's happened on campus that might, you know, that students need to be aware of. We also had it implemented that we would put under that where mental health resources was because every student gets that email. So we thought that it would be a good idea, just like the syllabus where every student will see it, every student will get that email and in case they were triggered in any way, they would know where to go. So I thought that that was really huge. Um, those little changes in policy make a huge difference. There's still more to go. What we would like to do, um, what we're still working on, um, I'm gonna be going back to school in the fall we want to start a task force um, in regards to just bringing CCD, UCD, and MSU together um, in regards to throwing events, making lots of different policy changes, and just making everything just out in your face, very visible in regards to here's where you can go if you need help, here's some self-care tips, here's anything that you need because I think that that thing that these things should be boisterous and it's starting to happen so that is my answer to that it's an ongoing process but we've already made a few changes not just at our area campus but at a few campuses which um, young advocates for young invincibles have done all over the state which I'm really proud of so yeah thank you for the question great thank you so much I see there's another question in here that Karen answered before she hopped off, um, but also related to colleges and universities asking of how can we organize to get more universities to do more or hire more people. Um, I think specifically related to the counseling centers. Um, and Ariel, feel free to add in some more here, but I know from some of the work that we've done um, at Y in the past, it's it seems like campuses can be um, very receptive to no cost solutions. So making, um, you know, increasing visibility of existing resources, kind of put, putting that information into syllabi and onto student um, ID cards and, and kind of bridging those gaps can be like easy first steps, but then how do we push campuses to do more? Um, I think again, hiring, you know, younger counselors, counselors who are people of color who work um, uh, varied hours so you can help students who are maybe attending night school. Um, all, all of those things comes with higher costs um, and it's, it seems to me that can be a little bit tougher to push campuses on. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, um, Ariel or, or anyone else. Go ahead. Um, I was gonna just put in, I feel like if a program was started in regards to internships that gave students college credit for volunteering their time in regards to pushing this all of these different policies and all these different plans in regards to mental health outreach and just planning events and just putting everything out there if students were incentivized by getting college credit through an internship program i think that that would make a huge difference because you might not be able to monetize it but to a student of color, or a student of any color, if you're getting like three credits for you doing something that you're passionate about and not necessarily getting paid, but those credits will turn into payment in the future. So, I mean, that's an idea. Um, if, I, if I can just jump in, I was gonna suggest that, you know, just like you people should always reach out to the members of Congress to help advocate for change on the federal level. Many schools um, have student governments that can help advocate as well as other organizations who either have a voice connected to the administration who can help push uh, for those kind of changes. So at my alma mater at American University, um, there's a student government that's very active and has the ability to sit on like the boards of uh, the president councils and is those areas where you can help put the direct change. Because even though, yes, I agree that having the information cards and non-cost solutions are important as well. But in the end of the day, we do know that in the end, there needs to be more resources. So more funding is definitely required to make the difference. Um, and that's where the pressure from the student body can actually be very helpful in addressing the change that um, is needed. Absolutely. And to piggyback off that, I feel like addressing the change that is needed in regards to putting more pressure 
on um, political sources that can give us our, our funding starts with just students being incentivized to get some college credit because it all starts with the seed and it all starts somewhere where um, there are kids like me, like not kids like me, but like there are younger people that are very passionate right now, especially right now who are going into college and who are looking for credit and who are looking for internships and who are looking to build themselves. So if you give them that and then you send them to the steps of the Capitol, then we can put that pressure on. But we don't have the funding for that now. So it all starts somewhere. So I'm just saying if we can start some internship programs where, you know, it, it's not specifically monetized or necessarily monetized, but you can give people some college credits, then you can send them to Congress and have them say, hey, we need this, and the more the merrier. You know what I'm saying? No, of course. Not. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, well, thank you all again so much for being here. I'd like to end on just kind of an open-ended question to all of you. Um, but just kind of thinking towards the future, where do you see momentum for progress, either in 2020 um, or in 2021, to expand access to mental health care? And I'll open it up to anyone who wants to start. Um, so obviously, we are in an election year, and all issues should be addressed. And I think mental health isn't just one of the other main and many issues that need to be addressed. And no matter what happens um, at during the election, you know, we are still going through a pandemic. There is still the need to address police brutality and systemic racism. There's an economic crisis going on. There's a lot of things that are affecting the mental health of many people, including and especially communities of color. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed one way or another. And it is, I think the metaphor is like dropping a pebble in the water and it's not the pebble, but the ripples. The, the effect of mental health is gonna last much longer than the pandemic itself. So we need to start finding the actual resources because we're gonna be dealing with mental health um, issues, I think, in a much larger scale uh, for years to come. So we need to, again, I think Congress is very interested and they definitely have expressed interest and I'm hopeful. I know my boss is very passionate about this issue and will continue fighting to ensure that resources are given to the people who really need mental health services in this country. Yeah, I agree with all of that and um, would just add, you know, we've been in some conversations about class, at class about are we here for the moment or for the movement? And I think, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier, these are issues that have been here. They were here long before the pandemic, long before the most recent rash of police brutality. Like these issues have been here. We have maybe a unique opportunity to really capitalize on the moment to make some really powerful changes. But the key is to make sure that the movement makes them per permanent um, and that we don't sort of squander the opportunities presented by this moment but also not mistake this moment for the whole thing so we got to be here for the movement not the moment absolutely very well said um just to piggyback on that um i feel like the iron is hot right now so it's definitely time to strike and it's definitely time to put some pressure on the leaders that can definitely make a change. And as it was said, it does, it's, it's not about the moment, it's about the movement. And I think that this conversation should be one of many that should last for a very, very long time. Absolutely. Um, well, I want to thank you all again so much for taking the time out of your day to join our panel. I think this has been a really, really great conversation and I appreciate all of your insights um, and very thoughtful responses and just the work you're doing in general. Um, it is, it's obviously very much needed and I very much appreciate it. Um, so thank you again um, and thank you to everyone who has joined the webinar today. Um, please join us next week, our final um, our third session of our three-part series will be next Thursday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we'll be focusing in on medical debt among young people. 
uh, which spoiler alert, a lot of medical debt comes from seeking out mental health services. Um, so it will, it will hopefully play in very well as a follow up to this conversation. Um, so thank you again to our speakers um, and everyone else, please follow us at uh, youngvincels.org and on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, please take care of yourselves and the people around you. Um, and we will talk again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the conversation thank and you. for having us. Thank you guys.